Well, this is the first opportunity I think I've ever had to play either Michael Parkinson, I've got the right coloured hair, or is it Graham Norton? I'll leave you to be the... Uh, I'll lead you to decide which, which one. But um, as you will know, um, very often at this stage in the day, we've broken off into uh, groups. But we decided, we'd, as Bishop Stephen said at the beginning, we'd, we decided we'd have a bit of a change uh, today and, and actually uh, have an interview um, to which you can then break off into buzz groups to discuss uh, later. And um, I have to say, Ian, um, I'm slightly responsible, I think, for you uh, being here today um, in the sense that, we, as you just saw, we're, we're thinking about developing mission partnerships. Uh, that means, as a church, we're facing major changes. And when you very kindly invited me to spend a day at DFS, I have to say I was absolutely amazed at uh, the sort of processes of change that you've been through, through leadership, through management, and, and felt that just as a church, we had an awful lot that we could actually learn uh, from, from uh, outside organizations. Uh, and so when I said that, they, they decided it would be marvelous you to join. So I'm really, really delighted to welcome you on behalf of everybody uh, this morning. Very grateful for the time you're giving us in what I know is already uh, a busy day. But uh, just to get us started in and just maybe to lure you into a false sense of security, um, I just wondered, as people don't know you, whether you could perhaps say a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to be at DFS. Right, I'll be delighted. Well, the first thing to say, you are 100% responsible for me being here. <laughs> So, uh, and thank you all for, uh, for inviting me here. I'm, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to meeting any of you who want to talk to me afterwards. Um, so my, my journey is, uh, I was born of a tall, six-foot, blonde, blue-eyed British man called Peter Michael Raymond Philby. Unfortunately, I didn't get any his, of his genes. I ended up getting the genes of Francisca Cami Maria Montserrat Garrido Guillén Philby, who was, my, who was my Spanish mother. Uh, so, uh, I was born uh, uh, in London 50 odd years ago, moved around the country, uh, ended up after university going to Boots the Chemist, that famous brand, a fabulous com company to work for, uh, based in Nottingham. Went through my career there, uh, ended up being trading director at Boots, and, um, and then as happens to people quite often when they get to 50, I was faced with a big uh, change where I was made redundant and uh, thought, oh dear, you know, is that, uh, is that the end? Uh, the wonderful thing is I had a fantastic year of change and uh, I've now got the best and the most exciting job in my career in my, in my 50s. So I've kind of been through personally a big change and then I've had to bring in a big change through the organization. Other important things about me in life is I'm married to a wonderful lady called Sue, who I've been with now for 35 years, since the very first day at college. Um, she it took her a long time to decide I was the right man, so we married 13 years later. I've got two lovely uh, kids at university, and then we've got what we call our Blair Project, because when we were in our early 40s and should have known better, we had a third, so we have a little uh, Frankie who is with us, who is at the ripe old age of 12. Um, love sport, love travel, that's a bit about me. And uh, so how did I get into DFS? Well, in, in that sort of year of being made redundant, I set up my own consultancy and helped people with retail and brand problems. And one of the companies that came to me, a private equity company, and they wanted me to run the, my eye over this little company called DFS, the nation's sofa specialist. I thought they were a fabulous Yorkshire-based company. I told them it would be a good idea to buy them. They did. And then they called my bluff and said, did I want to put the family silver into the company and then run them? So that was just over three years ago. And uh, I've had a fabulous three-year experience. Uh, thanks, Ian. We, we, and we'll come on to the whole thing about change in, mm. in a moment. But I, I suppose the one thing that all of us think we know about DFS is that it has a sale for the whole year. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I know talking from you, DFS has come from a particular place to where it is now. And again, I wonder if you could just give us a brief history of that. And yeah, no, it's... Uh, uh, I, I, there is, there is a... Uh, there is uh, things going on in social media, and apparently it's got something like 150,000 sort of uh, inputs. It says, you know, what will be the only thing left after Armageddon? 
and apparently it's the DFS sale. <laughs> and why should I break such a great tradition? Uh, no, the company's been going for 44 years, uh, and the first 41 years before I arrived, it was founded by a wonderful Yorkshire entrepreneur now called Lord Kirkham. Um, so literally started from a, from a billiards hall in Doncaster and he turned it into uh, a great British company, market leader with 75 stores, uh, which is what it was when I took over three years ago. Vertically integrated, a really interesting sort of model. They have everything from their own designers, uh, own wood mills making their own frames. We're the largest sofa manufacturer in Europe, here in the UK, not a lot of people know that. Uh, in all our stores we have our own uh, vans, our own delivery and installation people and every store has a couple of upholsterers so that we can provide aftercare service. So he created this great sort of end-to-end uh, national family uh, based really on hard-working Yorkshire values and, and, and that's what I arrived in three years ago. Thank you. I mean, most of us will know DFS as well just by going into the department stores but clearly there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes as I experienced in my day with you. I mean, could you again Ian, just talk us through some of the changes that you've been making over the past few years? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, why did, why did I think it was a great opportunity? It, it's fantastic to have this, uh, as we were, uh, market leader. But when I did, when I helped the private equity company look at the company, I just saw that there were so many more opportunities to spread, you know, what we were about to a broader uh, church of people uh, in, in the UK and therefore we could make, we could create more growth, we could create more jobs in the UK, we could create more, more um, wealth for all the people involved around the company. So one of the first things that I had to do, if you might imagine, you know, they suddenly were presented with having had this very autocratic, very, very strong personality in Lord Kirk and running them for 41 years, running every single element of the company, and they were suddenly presented with a guy from Pills and Potions, from Boots, who kind of said, I think we might better do things differently. Um, so that, that's kind of what, what I walked into and, and that sort of change is a very interesting place because I took over a fantastically well run company with most people having been in the company 20 years plus. A, a vast experience um, and I had to persuade them that things needed to be done differently because the world was changing and the ambition was changing. So the first thing I had to sort of dis to, to get across them is if we always do things the way we've always done them, don't be surprised if you only get what you always used to have. And, and that's just such a big thing. It, I had to face it when I was made redundant at the age of 50. I kind of wanted my world to carry on the way it was, but it, it wasn't because that wasn't the reality anymore. So introducing people to the concept that we will have to do things differently, but for a reason, not just because I've come in from pills and potions, was the start point of, of the change uh, journey. Um, I then, I then, do you mind if I just talk a little bit about what I went through and in terms of how do I, did I affect the change? Because we've changed very dramatically in, in three years. Um, I, there's a lovely phrase that I was taught once that God gave us uh, one mouth and two ears. Uh, try and use them in that proportion. And, and that was quite difficult for me because I quite like talking. Um, but I did spend the first year putting in very little change. I had to establish, you know, actually how everything works. I, I went around every single store, every single factory, every single development of every single department in, in the, in the organisation for a year, listening and learning, but also explaining to them the new journey that we were on. So that was the, that was the very first part of patience and gosh when you go into seeing something that you want to change how desperately you want to start taking action so the first big phase was uh, not to taking action uh, but learning how it all works the second thing is when you're very successful as the organization was you don't think you need to change and indeed you don't want to change because that is how you've become famous. You know, every day you're in control because the beast has run that way for all the time and it has made each individual in the company successful and comfortable. 
So you need to start giving people a sense of what, what different can look like and uh, what maybe better could look like. And funnily enough, one of the things that the organization didn't do was actually ask the customers what they thought about us. So they, on the basis that they were successful and things were working all right, they just kind of assumed that everything that was happening, our customers liked it. And guess what? They didn't all the time. They loved some things, and that's why we're the market leader, and other things they didn't like. So on, on that journey in the first year, I set up things like customer panels. You know, who is your customer? And I'm no doubt you're all thinking about who are your customers? You know, who are you trying to appeal to or change your perception of? And one of the things to do is I, I made it very uncomfortable. I went to an area and I'd asked just some random customers of, of DFS in North London to come, 25 of them in a group and five of us on the stage, mixture of the local manager, directors, heads of department, and we asked some tough questions of the, of, uh, the, of the customers, and they didn't tell us all the time what we wanted to hear. But it began to give people a sense of why there was a need for change, because the world was moving on. Um, I'll give you one little example, because I think it can, can help bring it to life. Um, we delivered between 9 o'clock and 4.30, five days a week, because that's had always worked. But, you know, we're in a world of, I'm afraid, Tesco.com, Amazon, six days a week. Um, and guess what? When we asked our customers what would be their preferred time of delivery, only 3% of all our customers said it was between 9 and 4.30, Monday to Friday. So in truth, we were delivering to 97% of our customers a suboptimal time. So just give you a flavor of, of some of the things. So having, having created a bit of a sense of we want to go to a different place, I then started gently getting into the area of having a shared vision of what we wanted to be, and it had to be motivating. And for us, we wanted to go from being a great British company to a world-class company. And that world-class thing has become the language now. Of the company. Everything that people do around the organization, they're asking themselves, are we doing this to world-class level, or are we just doing it to our comfortable, great British level? And that's given a common language to the whole organization to understand where they needed to change. So the next stage around that was then to talk about uh, what the big goal was and how we were going to do it with some granularity, because everybody had a different view what good looked like, and you had to start spend, spending time as a top group, really detailed, uh, examining what good looked like. What was the acceptable time between putting something right for a customer in their home would be an example of that. What was going to be the quality of all our products? Get everybody in the team in the same place. So the shared vision was a really important way of then making everybody think we've got to do things differently around here. And then I was able to start accelerating. Once we had that sense of the customers not completely happy with us, we got regular measurement of it, we had a rich descriptor of where we wanted to go, then the, the change started happening, literally probably only in the last sort of year and a half of the three years, uh, real pace, because there's a purpose, there's an understanding. And that's enabled me to add new expertise from outside the company, so I've got a lovely blend now of all the old experts in the company, plus a handful of new experts doing the things that customers want in the 21st century that we weren't doing. As you will gather, I could go on, but I'm going to let Bishop Peter interject with some more precise questions. No, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. For that. I mean, one of the things you were talking about there were clearly stakeholders in terms of your customers, but but clearly, I'm, I'm, well, I'm guessing that some of the stakeholders uh, were also the people who work in your factories and in your department stores and and in the ed, uh, head office here. How how have you been able to galvanise those different departments together? Well, uh, in an old autocracy, which I had, um, uh, people were not used to being um, uh, accountable. They were incredibly responsible, mm -hmm. but not accountable. Um, when you start giving accountability to people, they realize that they need people alongside them. In, a, in, a, in an autocracy, everybody can be in a silo doing the stuff for the guy at the top. When you lose that, and actually you're all in a shared vision, you suddenly realize your interdependence. Uh, 
And by giving people uh, precise accountability, they then needed to lean uh, on, on each other uh, a lot more because they didn't have the benefit of somebody who would always give them the answer. They had to create their own answers. And, and again, you know, when, I, when people sort of said, well, if we're going to be world class, then um, as world class, if, I'm, if I've got a critical illness, I expect to be paid. And in the old company, you weren't. Um, people used to work five and a half days a week. You know, I, I, need, I need two days a week to, uh, to recover. I, I thought everybody in the organization needed, five, uh, needed two days. Uh, there was no sickness pay. So there were a number of things where people were just working incredibly hard, but almost because that, they were paid well, and that was part of the deal. And I created a, I have created a situation where people feel uh, much more valued at the sort of the human level and much more in control of creating what is, what is world class. Because world class is also about how everybody feels about being, uh, being treated as somebody that you'd expect to be treated in the 21st century. Ian, we're not going to let you off the hook yet, but I just wonder if at this point we might invite John uh, to come and join in our conversation with us. John has been our keynote speaker uh, this morning. Um, uh, Ian, f firstly to you, but then, I, then I'll, I'll come to John. But um, who, how have external factors um, affected the way you've managed the change in the organisation? Um, well, as, as you all know, it's, it, it'd be lovely to go into organisation, create this lovely vision and everything sails forward. Unfortunately, uh, as, you, as you will all be aware, we've been in, in some of the toughest economic times for a long time. So unfortunately, the market I operate in, just when I'm trying to encourage everybody that it's really exciting to do change and it's going to make the world better, We've had three years where the, our market, which is a discretionary market, you can always put off buying a sofa for another year, has actually gone backwards. So instead of all this change equaling lots of new exciting sales and everybody's being very uh, positive and the change is hunky-dory, uh, one of the things that's, that's created a real tension is the changes have happened, but the performance has stayed pretty stagnant even though our share's gone up. But people are sort of saying, well, is it because we've changed? So that's created a really interesting backdrop against which to, uh, um, to enforce some, some change. So John, you, in, in, when you were speaking to us, you, you talked also about uh, looking outwards. You also talked about partnerships and, and external factors. What sort of external factors do you think are impinging on us or affecting us as we look to change in our mission partnerships? Uh, I think very much the same ones as Ian's talking about, actually. And particularly, I would highlight people needing to be valued and the accountability thing and people needing to understand that, uh, whilst in one sense the church is autocratic, but it's God who's at the top. <laughs> and uh, we're all on the level so far as God is concerned. And I think we need to remember that and remind ourselves of it. Uh, but as you were talking, I think particularly that thing about people being valued for who they are, their contribution, and so on, uh, because this is a missional issue. Um, I mean, if the church is not a place like Ian has described, and given that the world itself, people suffer so much alienation and distortion of their humanity in a sense, if the church is just more of the same, why would we expect anybody to want to join us? It is that simple. Thank, thank you. Again, Ian, Ian, Ian to you first. Um, at the end of the day, people will only buy what they want to buy. Um, and they're not going to buy what they don't want, really. So what do you think the church can learn, if anything, from that idea that folk will only buy what they want and that they won't buy what they don't want? Well, you're spot on there. We, we've yet to succeed in getting people to buy what, uh, what they don't want to buy. It, 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 I think Bishop it, Stevens succeeded this morning. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. This is a... <laughs> uh, very good. I, I, I think the sort of, the sort of, the, the, the sort of parallel is uh, back to listening to our customers. You know, how do we know what they want to buy? Well, there's a mixture of if you put something out there and they don't buy it, then you, you've got a bit of a clue. Um, 
but you need to you need to talk to them to, to get a flavor so I think it probably goes back from your point of view is well who do you want to talk to in the church um, a little bit of background I, I'm, a, I'm I'm a Roman Catholic by birth I now uh, belong to two parishes locally I'm both a Roman Catholic and I also am a member of the local C of E church. My wife's C of E, we married in a C of E church, so I consider myself to be absolutely in between and, uh, and, and dead happy with it, actually. Um, but when I go to my local church, I, I'm, I'm the youth policy at our church. <laughs> LAUGHTER And that's a real worry, isn't it? Because uh, I'm 54. And by far the youngest there. And, and it's a lovely little community. It's caught up in all the things you're describing here in terms of it's now one of about sort of five parishes with a, with a, a lady who runs around between all of us. But I sometimes wish in my heart that we'd reach out to, to the broader community in, in our village. Um, because in the end, it's, it's potentially a club for the over 54s. In, 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 our, in our village and yet you know the, we've got this a thousand year old beautiful chapel Norman Chapel we're in the heart of the community I'd love us to find ways of thinking how can this just be used by different chunks of the people here and maybe that will be the back doorway into uh, into a spiritual life for them you know it's, it's pretty hard just to convert people overnight but if you get them involved in the location and they get to feel uh, the so many big positives that, that we bring, I think, uh, to life, to people. Um, so, you know, I, I'd, reflect on, I'd reflect on that, I guess, you know. Who, who is your customer locally? Thank you. Yeah. John, uh, you, you uh, some while ago, not in your talk this morning, but you talked about the McDonaldization of, of the church. Now, whether we like McDonald's or not, there is no doubt it is hugely successful and it is clearly selling what people want. Uh, do you think we have anything to learn from McDonald's and from big organisations like DFS? Uh, well, I, I, I think um, the church is clearly... There's a bit of me doesn't want to use this marketing terminology, I have mm. to say that, but I'll go with it. Uh, the church clearly is selling what some people want. There's no question whatsoever about that. Otherwise, none of us in this room would have a job, so it's, it is that simple. But my, my issue really is, okay, roughly speaking, that's about 10% of the population in this country. So what about the 90% of the glass that is empty? What about those people? And those people clearly um, do not resonate with how we have, if I put it like this, how we've packaged our product, if you like, because that seems to me to be the, the challenge, is, which might be as simple as um, some people will never ever be in church at, eight, at 9.15 on a Sunday morning, which I am, because they'll have been in the club or whatever the night before and they will not be out of bed. Um, other people I think of, many men of my age, and I guess of Ian's age as well, uh, they only get access to their children at the weekend. Um, are they likely to come and worship with us if it happens to be 10, 10.30, 11 on a Sunday morning? I don't think so, but it's nothing to do with their spiritual search. So for me, this is asking that question about the 90% who are not with us, rather than um, getting steamed up or bothered about these many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions even in this country, who are engaged with, with church, um, but saying, okay, that's fine, um, but what about those who are not? And another dimension that I think has been clearly demonstrated as feeding into this is the whole business of personality type. Uh, because over many years, 20 or 30 years now, Leslie Francis, who some of you will know, has done huge amount of research into the personality types of church people, leaders as well as members. And overwhelmingly, we are all of one personality type. So there's a bit of me, and, and interestingly, that personality type is ISTJ on the Myers-Briggs scale. Interestingly, the government tell us in recent government statistic that roughly 10% of the population of the UK are, surprise, surprise, ISTJ. So actually we might be maxing out our potential market. We might not be in the mess we think we are. It might be that 
people who say, if I was going to follow Jesus, I would do it this way, we're reaching most of them. But what about the people who are saying, you know, I'd love to follow Jesus. I'd even love to engage in some of your ancient traditions and practices. Um, but I wouldn't do it like that. And it, that, that to me is, is one of the key questions. It's, so when I talk about McDonaldization, there's a bit of me wants to say, I'm not grumbling about what the church is. I am part of the church today. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not grumbling about the church today, but I'm asking that big missional question, what about the other people? And actually I know loads of them who are fascinated by ancient traditions, the things we know how to do. It's just that they're not going to do them at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning um, and probably not 8 o'clock on a Sunday night. But if these same things happened at 1 o'clock on a Tuesday lunchtime or 8 o'clock on a Thursday night when somebody goes to the gym or whatever, we, I was going to say we might be in a different, I know we're in a different situation because people who are doing that are actually connecting with others who otherwise wouldn't follow Jesus. Now, time is pressing on. Now, I've got a whole raft of questions I'd like to ask, but, but I think we'll end with just one more question. I've got one I want to ask Ian. Oh, right. Good. Well, you, that might be far more important than mine. You feel free, John. On a scale of one to ten, how do you rate this sofa? <laughs> now, I'd hate to be rude. <laughs> However, I don't think it's going to get floor space in my stores. <laughs> Final question. I'm sure all of us, I'm going to ask you first, John, but all of us, I'm sure, are interested in what you were talking about, tribalism and how sometimes that intrudes. But isn't it also a truth that... Uh, tribalism preserves the identity of the tribe and don't we in some way as the church need to preserve what we are historically as well as looking to the future and many changes well yes but I think the church historically and its essence as we find in the New Testament is to be an inclusive church um, so going back to you know St Paul about neither male nor female slave nor free Jew nor Greek uh, we can multiply that in many different ways and I think it's when that that kind of tribalism that we see reflected in some of the struggles between Jews and Gentiles for example in the early church that kind of narrow sectarianism or that narrowness that says you can only read the Bible the way I read it and if you don't you're not the real a real Christian um, you can only drive the same car as I drive or you're not the real deal because you spent too much or too little. I mean, we, we get tied up with these trivialities. And uh, I think, I wouldn't use the word tribalism to describe um, the essence of Christian values. Of course, Christians should be distinctive and different, but we should be distinctive and different for the positive things, the value we're adding to the culture not for these negativities. And I, that is one of our big issues, is that most people out there think that we are negative, awkward, nasty, judgmental. I could multiply the adjectives, but I'll spare everybody's blushes because you know what they are. Um, the reality is, if we're not nice to, don't look like we're nice to each other, then why would we expect anybody to, it is that simple. I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree. It, Ian, from a, from a business perspective, you've obviously had to rely a lot on HR to, to affect the changes that, that you've made as well. But doesn't that also create a sense of tribe, which by any other name we might call team? Yes, no, I mean, it's you know, one of the things that uh, it gives me enormous pleasure um, three years on is when I arrived and everybody's thinking what's this man with pills and potions going to do to our organization I think there was a great fear that a lot of people would leave because the world was changing around them um, I took on a top team of uh, the top three layers of the team were 26 and here's an interesting point 26 males in the organization um, I'm absolutely delighted that all 26 of the original tribe uh, are still with us 
I have added five senior females, so we're, we're now a 31 top tribe. Um, double the number of females in our stores, double the customer satisfaction over the last uh, three years, put in records, sales and profits. So we've got happy customers, I've got happy owners. Uh, the tribe, the old tribe are all still with us and beginning to realize that maybe this new world isn't so bad after all. In fact, gosh, dare I say it, it might even be slightly more fun because the new tribe that I've added, people coming from the outside with a different mindset, bringing in some new ideas, have actually proven to be quite exciting. And so, again, with the patience of the journey, mixing in a bit of new tribe uh, with the old tribe can, can lead to a more embracing, happier, bigger, uh, more successful tribe if I use, uh, use your uh, language. Ian, thank you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, time has actually caught up with us and we, and we must move on, but I'm, I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, we, we could go on asking questions all morning, because I, I think the debate we're just beginning to have and the conversation that's opening up between you is absolutely fascinating. But I do know Ian doesn't have to dash off immediately so we will be around for just a little while over lunch if people would like to obviously carry on the conversation with Ian as well and also with John but can we show our appreciation both to Ian and to John for this thank you